Um, I'm uh, Patrick Bishop. I'm talking to you today about a man called Bill Ash, who was a great hero and a great character. You probably groan when you hear those two terms nowadays. You've come to regard uh, the word hero with a certain amount of suspicion. Uh, if you want to be a hero, it seems the entry level is, is uh, pretty low and the bar is, and it is uh, <coughs> set only a, a foot or two above the ground. Anyone who does basically what they're asked to do or paid to do seems to qualify as a hero. And in terms of uh, characters, uh, anyone who's seeking attention for themselves, which seems to be an increasing number across the population of Britain, qualifies as a character. But the life of Bill Ash is a reminder of what those two words actually mean. I never met, actually met Bill Ash. Um, the first time I came across him was when he died, uh, which was only last year, at the age of 96. I read his obituary in the Telegraph, and uh, all the other obituaries made the same point about it, which was that um, he was alleged to be the uh, inspiration for the character of Virgil Hillis. There was the American airman played by Steve McQueen in a great film, The Great Escape. I'm sure you all remember Virgil Hiltz. He was this uh, moody, leather jacketed, uh, rebellious character who uh, spent a lot of time in the camp prison, hence his uh, nickname, The Cooler King, uh, which is the subtitle of my book about Bill. Um, when he was there, he whiled away the hours, bouncing his baseball against the uh, concrete walls of the cell. Uh, and it was also, of course, the character of one of the great moments in the film, when almost at the point of uh, freedom, he's on the border in Switzerland, and he's still on a German uh, motorcycle, and he tries to rev it up and flip it over the, over the fence. Now, um, Whenever Bill was asked about his resemblance to this character, he'd always sort of smile and say, uh, no, it, it, I wasn't American, yes indeed I wasn't subject of three, but um, I never rode a motorcycle, I never played baseball, and indeed I never took part in the, in the Great Escape. Um, but, so this, I think, but this was actually a, uh, an indication of his genuine modesty rather than the true facts, because if you actually look at it, uh, it was quite possible that, that Bill could have been uh, the foundation for that character. He was uh, an extraordinarily determined escaper. He was in the suburb of three at the same time as Paul Brickhill, the man who wrote the book The Great Escape, on which the film was made. But it wasn't Bill's style to seek the limelight or hog it. And he portrayed all his trials and tribulations during those years of various prison of war camps as a long black comedy. <coughs> um, so after, after having read about his death, I just decided to look into his life. And, uh, I do quite a lot of that in my, in my business as a historian. And um, often you find that the business of, of reconstructing people's lives is actually more a matter of demolishing them. You find that uh, when you actually look at reputations, uh, the more you look at them, you start to handle them and look at them from different angles, and they start to come apart in, in your hands. But uh, in the case of Bill, uh, exactly the opposite process happened. Uh, and so when I, I set out to actually discover the basic sort of facts of his life, I was up against a big problem, which was that there wasn't much to go on from Bill's own archive. He, he left a few uh, writings behind, but they, they start off by saying, apologising for the fact that it actually he was um, really hopeless at remembering names and dates uh, and, and places even. And so my initial reaction was one of suspicion. I thought, well, you know, the story he's telling is so remarkable and so extraordinary that perhaps uh, this is a way of disguising the fact that it wasn't quite as extraordinary as it seemed. But when I actually checked what he'd said against uh, the official records of those other people's accounts, um, I found that uh, far from bigging himself up, Bill was actually underplaying uh, what he'd done. Um, his story started off in Texas. He was born in 1917 in the, in the middle of, well, so he grew up in the, in the Depression. His father was a 
traveling salesman who went around the small towns of Texas trying to flog women's hats to uh, small storekeepers. And Bill sometimes went with him and experienced the terrible humiliations he had to suffer when people turned him down. Uh, Bill himself had to uh, work almost as soon as he could walk. He managed to put himself through the uh, education system, ending up at the University of Texas, where he graduated summa cum laude. But even that wasn't enough in those bad times to get him a job. Um, so he had dreams of being a, a writer, never, never realized. And he ended up being a bum, you know, riding the rails between from town to town doing a succession of menial jobs. Now that experience gave him uh, two big things which were the kind of pillars of his life, I think. One was a sense of humor, a very kind of whimsical sense of humor where he treated everything, even his greatest trials and tribulations, as a dry joke. It was quite childlike sometimes. It also gave him a profound socialism, so he came away to being probably the only communist in Texas at that time, <laughs> something that probably hasn't changed since. Um, it, but, and it also gave him, of course, a great hatred of fascism, so he was too young to go to the Spanish Civil War, and when the war broke out in 1939, of course, America was not a participant at that stage, and rather than hang around and wait for them to commit themselves, he crossed the border, went to Canada, and joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, qualified as a pilot, got a commission, and by the spring of 1941 was in, uh, in Britain with 411 Squadron, the Canadian Squadron based in, at that time in Lincoln, um, where he rapidly took to Air Force life. He loved being an airman, even though sometimes he found the, uh, some of the chafing aspects of service life uh, a bit difficult to take. Uh, one was that his station commander turned up one day hearing that Bill had been addressing his ground staff by their first names and uh, ordered him to stop doing that, saying, from henceforth, you just use surnames when you're talking to ground staff. And Bill said, yes, sir, I'm terribly sorry about that, and proceeded to issue a string of orders to his fitter. Uh, the fitter's name was Corporal Darling. <laughs> fighting career was uh, short and not terribly glorious. He was shot down in March 1942 over the Pan Calais and uh, was immediately survived the crash landing, which was quite an extraordinary thing in itself. He was immediately picked up by uh, a local, he, he walked into the, the nearest house he came to, and a, a local woman took him in, issued him with civilian clothing, passed him into the local uh, resistance reso, who moved him up the line to Paris, where he spent a couple of weeks in the summer before uh, neighbours betrayed the people who were sheltering him, and he was captured by the Gestapo, still beaten, interrogated, and sentenced to death as a spy. He was saved by his old enemy, the Luftwaffe. A uh, Luftwaffe officer came in and said, uh, This is our man, he's a, he's a pilot, and therefore he's our prisoner. And so Bill had the, his old enemies to thank for the fact that he was saved for a second time. Uh, he sent it to start with three. And at this point, you would think that, you know, having cheated death on a couple of occasions, you might actually decide enough was enough and keep your head down and try and have a, uh, a, an easy life. But uh, Bill didn't do that. He was an obsessed with escaper. I and mean, any opportunity that presented itself, whether it's opportunistic or whether it's a long, drawn out affair that took weeks and months to realize. Uh, he took it, and from the very beginning to the very end, he was absolutely determined to escape. Um, now, that's something that uh, I think people don't realize is that um, not many people in prison of war camps actually thought and spent every night, uh, every day, dreaming of, of uh, getting out of the place. And Robin took a very sensible view, which I'm sure I would have done myself, that uh, you, you cheated death on several occasions just wait for the war to end and make the best use of the time that you could. Bill was not of that, uh, of that mind at all. Um, and you have to wonder uh, why it was that, that uh, he was determined to carry on taking all these risks over, risks over and over again. Um, and he was an articulate, intelligent man, Bill, but um, he was quite actually uh, tongue-tied when it came to explaining why this should be. And I think there were if you could boil it down to anything, it was, it was two things. Once he had a, one, he had an absolutely 
uh, and that's the inability to accept limitations on his own physical freedom. And the other was that he felt ashamed of the fact that he hadn't done more to inflict more damage on the German war machine. And this was a way, a small way, of fighting back against the enemy. Um, he'd been doing that. I mean, something you realize when you're studying uh, the whole business of escaping is that the, the risks that people like Bill took were large enough by our standards, but they were tiny compared with the standards that the people are actually helping them, the French and the Poles, etc. Worst Bill could be, could expect before the, the scene changed in uh, March 1944 was to be an extent in the cooler, but if you were a Polish peasant or a, a, a French resistant, if you were caught, you were up against the wall, boom, that was it. Um, but he, he agonized about this after the war, but none of the people that helped him in his many escape attempts ever turned around to him and said, uh, what we did was wrong, we should be thought about it differently. They accepted, what he accepted was that the enemy was so big and so noxious that uh, the only thing you could do if you wanted any kind of life, if you looked forward to any kind of future that had any meaning, uh, was to fight by any means you had and to keep up the struggle, no matter how difficult it was or whatever the cost. Bill did finally um, escape. It was a couple of weeks before the end of the war, a couple of days rather before the end of the war, when he was in the camp near Bremen and the Guards Army Division turned up. Uh, and he managed to get out while the fight was raging between them and the diehard defenders uh, of the camp. Um, when he got back to Britain, he was a confined, uh, confirmed Anglophile. He, he thought something wonderful about Britain from his exposure to the Brits. It meant when he was uh, on station in, in Britain and those he was in the camp, he married an English girl. Uh, and he got a job at the BBC, but his politics didn't really uh, chime with the, those of the corporation in those days, he parted company fairly quickly. Um, he was a socialist at the end of his days. Um, I'm sorry to say this, Charles, he wasn't a big fan of Maggie. Uh, I think he would have been absolutely overjoyed to hear that Jeremy Corbyn had been elected and he didn't see the day. Uh, and his politics never actually uh, cut across the way he lived his life. So one of his best friends was a chap called Paddy Barthrop, who was a great uh, Battle of Britain pilot, a man who the term robust, robustly right wing doesn't really do justice, but they were they were great mates and they would meet up at um, Paddy's uh, flat, which, uh, sorry, at um, Bill's flat, which Paddy was delighted uh, to point out was in Moscow Row uh, for late night sessions and yarns and reminiscences. But, you know, uh, Bill was not a, a Stalinist. His, his view of uh, what socialism meant was. Uh, really based on what he had in his early days, his early upbringing, seeing the camaraderie of um, life on the rails as a hobo, and also life in the camps. And the question he always asked himself was, why is it that you know we can display this selflessness uh, and this nobility in extremist wartime conditions, and we can't carry them over into peacetime? Thank you very much.